In today's culture, evolution is the topic of one of the most heated debates. I am here today not only to respond to creationist claims, but to provide what, in my opinion, is the best evidence for evolution. But first we need to understand what I'm talking about. A very common creationist claim is that there are six kinds of evolution. And boy have creationists really made me hate the word kinds. But that's beside the point. They talk about cosmic evolution, chemical evolution, stellar evolution, organic evolution, microevolution, and macroevolution. These are the six kinds of evolutions they try to talk about. They try to talk about these as if they are kinds of evolutions. This is clearly poisoning the well. When scientists use the term evolution, they're talking about how life changed over time to explain all of the biological diversity we have today. No one uses the term cosmic evolution. They're talking about the Big Bang or just the origin of the universe. Chemical evolution is also not a thing. It's called nucleosynthesis. Stellar evolution is also not a thing. You could try to refer to it that way, but you would be wrong. It's just the star's life cycle, or how a star forms. And organic evolution is the origin of life, or abiogenesis, or what have you. The last two are evolution, though, although they heavily misrepresent it. Microevolution is small-scale evolution, but it's also limited to variation within a single interbreeding population. Macroevolution is large-scale evolution, but it's also variation between species, when one species splits up into two genetically distinct populations. There will never be a first generation between early hominids and modern homo sapiens where you can say, oh, that's a human, but that guy before them wasn't. If one species gives birth to an entirely different species, that would be enough to actually disprove evolution. Small changes add up to big changes over time. There is no leap of faith, no leap in thought here. It's just like the difference between a microwalk and a macrowalk. A microwalk would be a walk to the kitchen. A macrowalk would be a walk to Alaska. The mechanism is exactly the same. The difference is time scale. But now I think it's about time we hop right into the evidence. Keep in mind, this is a very small sample. This isn't even half of a half of a percent of what's out there to learn about evolution. And this is only, in my opinion, what is strong evidence. Well, actually, I think it's all strong evidence, but I picked what I thought was the strongest evidence. I will be going over its predictive capability, its falsifiability, and then other evidence from other scientific disciplines. Let's first begin with predictive capability. Predictive capability is the bedrock to a good scientific hypothesis. You make an observation, you try to explain it some way, and then you make a prediction as to what you would see, what you would expect, if and only if your theory, your hypothesis, was true. Let's hop back to Darwin's day. No, no, not Darwin day, Darwin's day, the time period when Darwin actually lived. He noticed that the fingers of modern birds looked like they were once hands of dinosaurs, but the fingers were fused. If that was actually the case, Darwin predicted we should be able to find a bird-like thing in the fossil record with unfused wing fingers. And just two years later, we found it. Archaeopteryx. It had feathers, but it also had free-moving fingers, a phenomenon that was best explained by evolution. On his journeys, Darwin came across an orchid in Madagascar, one that had its nectar so deep within it, no known animal could pollinate it. What the hell was going on? I mean, Darwin figured there had to be something that did, so he predicted there should be a butterfly or an insect or something with a tongue long enough to get to the bottom of the flower and get the nectar. In 1903, that very thing was found. Darwin's hawk moth. This species of moth has a foot and a half long proboscis, which lets it get nectar from the flower, and in the process, it gets pollen on its head, and then proceeds to pollinate other flowers that way. But my absolute favorite, my absolute favorite example 
of the predictive capability of evolution is that of Tiktaalik. If there is a fossil name, you should never forget. If there is a fossil name, you should always remember. It's this one. Evolutionary theory suggested there should be a transition between fish and tetrapods. This was the missing link creationists had been asking for. It is the perfect split between fish and amphibian. It had a crocodile's head on a salamander's trunk, attached to a fish's ass and tail. Unlike any fish, Tiktaalik even had a neck. It had gills, scales, and fins. It had rib bones. It had lungs. This was it. This was the transitional fossil, predicted and then later found exactly where evolution said it would be, in the late Devonian. Next, we can head towards falsification. If something's falsifiable, that means it has the ability to be proven wrong, and that's incredibly important in science. If your idea can't be proven wrong, there's no actual way to test it, is there? Scientists used to think the universe was filled with something called ether, something that didn't interact with anything, but it gave light its speed. They noticed that light acted like a wave, and they figured that <laughs> all waves act the same. So just like a wave in water has to travel through water, and sound waves have to travel through air, then light should also have some sort of similar property that it has to travel through. Long story short, they were wrong. Their experiments demonstrated that there was no such thing as ether. It was later replaced by Einstein's special theory of relativity. The point is, it must be falsifiable. And evolution is incredibly falsifiable. An easy way to falsify evolution would be to find a Tyrannosaurus rex fossil in the Devonian, or a human fossil in the Triassic, or fossil bunnies in the Precambrian. But so far, all evidence in every discipline of science points towards evolution. What I'm about to show you is a clip from a YouTuber, Logic, one of my favorite YouTubers, and I suggest checking him out if you haven't. In this clip, he breaks down the geologic column and explains how it works in a simple and easily digestible way. So let's say that the whole world is covered in a bunch of layers of rock that were laid down very slowly. Now, let's say you pick any random town off the map. Let's say Union Center, South Dakota. And you go to Union Center and you find that there are three layers of rock, just to keep it nice and simple. In the bottom layer, there are Spider-Man action figures. In the middle layer, there are a bunch of Green Goblin action figures. And in the top layer, there are Scorpion action figures. And yeah, sometimes you'll find a Spider-Man in the Green Goblin layer, or maybe even in a Scorpion layer. But you'll never find a Scorpion lower than a Green Goblin, or a Green Goblin lower than a Spider-Man. And now let's say you head on east to Enning, South Dakota, and you look at the layers again. Here you have three layers again, but instead of having Spider-Man, then Green Goblin, then Scorpion, there's Green Goblin, then Scorpion, then Vulture. This doesn't really tell you much, but maybe it gets you thinking. So now let's say instead of heading east to White Owl, South Dakota, you head everywhere else in the world and check the layers, and as you do it, you notice that you never find a Green Goblin lower than a Spider-Man or a Vulture lower than a Scorpion. Not every place will have all the layers, but you have some layers everywhere, and they overlap with other layers in other places. Sometimes you might be missing, say, a Green Goblin layer, but the Scorpion layer will still be above the Spider-Man layer. So you start to draw them one on top of the other, probably in some sort of... I don't know... column. Because at this point you have so many layers that it would be about impossible for it to be a coincidence, and so there pretty much has to be some reason that the layers are in that order. Now, what you draw is not going to be reflected directly any place in the world, but if you tell someone else to go around the world a second time and look at which action figures belong to which layers, their drawing is going to end up about the same as yours. I think you get the point. We don't find things where we shouldn't find them. If we found something where we wouldn't expect to find it, we would have to rethink all of evolution. But while we're in the fossil record, let's fly over to the late Cretaceous period. Oh. You'll, you'll get it in a minute. Here we can find some of the strongest evidence for evolution. We can see how species diverged, and how they evolved so differently from one another. You can almost call it macro, because it is. It is macro. All we need to do is look at velociraptors and oviraptors. First, velociraptors have the same quillbers on their forearms that vultures do, suggesting they had wings but couldn't fly. Now why would that be? For the answer to that, we have to go over to their cousin, 
the Oviraptor. Their name implies that they stole eggs, because they were always found with eggs. We even found this fossil. It looks like a chicken sitting on a nest. Now why would that be? I mean, this Oviraptor clearly has its arm wrapped around these eggs. You don't do that unless you have insulating wings. Evidence like this shows the evolution of wings had nothing to do with flight or getting away from predators. Here's a clip from Arn Ra's video, Pterosaurs are Terrible Lizards, and it shows an earlier form of flight from something we call the Microraptor. In the same year that Disney's dinosaur came out, a fossil was discovered which confirmed how dinosaurs adapted their feathers for flight. It was a four-winged glider called Microraptor. An ornithologist named C. William Beebe detected a trait in Archaeopteryx which most others had missed, the fact that it had a few flight feathers on its hind legs. They weren't enough to be useful, so he proposed a hypothetical earlier form which he called Tetrapteryx. He didn't know that we would call it Microraptor because this illustration of his prediction was published a century ago in 1915. This was someone who was definitely on the right track. Not only that, but we can show how feathers evolved independently. Here's another clip from that same video. Feathers are complex structures made from multiple sequential stages of development. They start out as a tubular bud of skin. Inside it, bud ridges begin to form, and a pattern begins where the emergence of new barb ridges on one side moves the others to combine into a central shaft. Additional ridges fuse to the shaft and eventually spread into the first branching fronds of a true feather. So we have a hollow spiky tube, then a downy feather tuft as the tube divides into disconnected barbs. When the next generation has barbs growing around the tube, they form a rachis. Then the barbs grow barbules and a series of matching connections to zipper the fronds together, and there is a complete double-veined feather. Each of these stages is well documented in embryology, and each stage is also mirrored in the fossil record of the evolution of theropod dinosaurs. Now, Different types of animals have independently evolved different types of eyes and other structures of different designs which are each unique to that lineage. But such a precise alignment of this sequence of these particular developments could not reasonably have evolved twice. Fully developed feathers are a one-time occurrence. They first appear in theropod dinosaurs and they've been inherited by birds. There is no possible alternative to this scenario. Evolution explains all these findings, and many more, perfectly. Another strong piece of evidence comes from vestigials. These are the organs or behaviors that we no longer need, but they weren't detrimental enough for them to go away. While we're still looking at fossils, let's go to Wales. No, not England. Wales, the animal. Biologists long suspected that whales came from land mammals, primarily because they still had leg bones. They're not even attached to anything, they just kind of float around in the blubber. But more recently, we discovered this fossil, Darudan. It had vestigial fine legs and vestigial forearm bones. We then found Rhodocetus. It actually had hind legs in the pelvis, but the pelvis wasn't fused, so it still swam around just like a whale. But more importantly, it had ankle bones. By following these clues, paleontologists were able to trace the origin of whales back to the same origin as bison and pigs. So now that we've went over the predictive capability, the falsification, the evidence from geology, and the evidence from biology, we can now go into the most convincing form of evidence, observational evidence. First, we can examine ring species. A ring species shows the process of speciation in action. In ring species, the species are distributed in more or less a line, such as around the base of mountain range. Each population is able to breed with the neighboring population, but the ones that meet at the end can interbreed. My favorite one is the salamander and Satina. Seven different subspecies of the salamander form a ring around California's Central Valley in the United States. At the south end, adjacent species, Clowberry and Escultsi, Escultsi? I'm probably butchering that. But anyways, they don't interbreed. They are two genetically distinct populations. But the observational evidence doesn't stop there. 
there are two small islands off their Croatian coast, Pod Copista and Pod Mercaru. In 1971, a population of Italian wall lizards were transported from Pod Copista to Mercaru. This species of lizard didn't exist on Mercaru previously, and on Capista, they generally had a diet of insects. Scientists left them there for 37 years, and in 2008, when scientists came back, they were mind blown. They found a flourishing population of lizards, except this one was massively different. This new population had longer, wider, thicker heads. They ran slower and responded differently to different threats. They shifted from eating mostly insects to mostly plants. On Capista, their diet was 90% insects and 10% plants. After just four decades, not even four decades, they had gotten bigger. Their bites have gotten stronger and their diet, well, it's 60% plant and 40% insects. But the most damning evidence that comes from this experiment is that they had evolved almost an entirely new organ. They had evolved a cachial valve. And that's something this lizard rarely has. Really, the things with the strongest cachial valves are the ones with plants as their diet. They had no need for this valve on Capista, but just after a few generations on Mercaru, they had to have it. Due to the environmental pressures, they were able to evolve a new organ, kind of, part of their stomach. Whatever, who cares, it's new and it's awesome. Evolution before our very eyes. Now you have to remember, this is a very small portion of evidence. It's not even a little bit of the evidence. It's not even a small portion of a small portion. This was just what I thought was really good evidence. Now you can find evidence in lectures, you can find evidence in books by a thousand different authors. This was just my contribution, and although I didn't actually do anything, I just kind of read some stuff and wrote it down and then said it. I think the examples I gave were some of the strongest evidence. For evolution. Now this is just my opinion, and remember there's plenty more out there, and there are plenty more I could have mentioned, but because of time constraints, I have to make a limited video. We find evidence in layers of rock. We find it from chemistry, biology, archaeology, paleontology, zoology, biodiversity. The list goes on and on and on. It never fucking ends. Evolution itself is a fact, explained by the theory of evolution. This should no longer be a topic of debate. It should be about integrating yourself in the modern world. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy the content, please consider dropping a like and subscribing to this channel. Make sure to share if you learned something, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, it's just as you assume and it's nothing but these humans Would like to blame mythology for everything they're doing They pray for non-existent gods to clean up the mess But never take responsibility, just claim it's a test See that religion you've been given is shit and it's all poison And it's partially the reason we bleed and it's all poison Though your worldview is poison, and your outlook is poison Denied all you want, but the truth is it's all poison